we're going to talk about something as we kick off this new series. Our new series is entitled Burn the Ships. And I had intended on preaching on fear, which will be the next message if that's what the Lord wants. Um, but that, that was my plan. I've had this series in the queue for a long time. And uh, on Thursday morning, I had a, an early morning breakfast with a friend who's a, a lead pastor here in the valley, phenomenal leader and pastor. And while we were together, I just felt the Lord start really speaking some things about this first message and that it wasn't going to be on fear. And so I want to give you the title of the message. It is not creative. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew 4, put a marker in Acts 3. This really isn't a message. Uh, so that you understand this, okay, you can get on YouTube and find better preachers than me in less than 10 seconds. When I get to heaven, as a senior pastor, I'm not going to be measured by how my sermons make you feel. I'm going to be measured by how my leadership helps you get where God's created you to go. Okay? And today, I believe, is a big moment in your life. And mine too. Okay? Here's how we're going to kick off this series. Didn't see it coming, but now with more of his perspective, it, it's brilliant and I could have planned, couldn't have planned it. Here's the title of this message. Repent. Repent. Now, some of you have heard that word abused and misused. Well, Preston, how do I know if I've heard that word abused or misused? You're really nervous right now. That's one way. The other way is if you think the word repent is a mean or a bad word, let me tell you why. Because the teaching you've received on it was from man, not from God. Repent is one of the sweetest words in our relationship with God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus steps into earthly ministry. These are the first words out of his mouth publicly to begin his ministry on the earth. And I want to show you in Matthew 4, verse 17, what those words were. From then on, Jesus began to preach. Here's the first word. Repent. Repent. Repent of your sins and turn to God. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, we're going to answer a couple of questions. And we're going to do it pretty quickly. And then we're going to have a moment alone with the Lord. Uh, but I want you to understand before we get into the questions. When I was sitting there at breakfast with my friend, he, he was telling me some amazing things that God is doing through him in this season. And as a friend, I was just celebrating for nearly two hours. It, it's miraculous. It's absolutely phenomenal to watch. And at one point, I said to him, I said, oh, my word, this whole time I've known you, I thought you were a Joseph. And now I realize you're a Daniel. And the moment I said those words, I felt the Holy Spirit say, is not that same calling upon you? The only difference between him and you is I'm waiting on you. I'm working through him. And I got the most loving spanking over the next two hours that I've ever gotten from the Lord. He even reminded me of Revelation chapter 3 where he says, if I love you, I correct you. And then he says, and when I rebuke you, respond with repentance. Okay. Here's what you need to know. Because there may be a few of you who are really mad at me because I got you out of bed today to come hear a message about repentance. Well, let me just tell you what I feel and what I sense from the Lord. 
I told my friend that night, because I didn't tell him everything that was going on between me and the Lord, that I was just getting a whooping lovingly through our whole breakfast. I texted him that night and I said, not to over-dramatize this, but there's a chance I look back on our breakfast this morning, many, many years from now, as a turning point in my life. And I, I feel that could be true for many of you. So let's ask and answer question number one. What is repentance? What is repentance? Now, before I answer that question and tell you what it is, let me tell you what it's not. The word repent does not mean stop sinning. It does not mean stop sinning. I actually believe there are a lot of unbelievers who have heard the gospel beginning with repent and they think it means stop sinning, and because they know they can't stop sinning, they don't think they can get saved. And here's what you need to know. Whether you know Jesus or not, everybody dies a sinner. Everybody. It's just that believers die saved sinners. If you think that when you get saved, you stop sinning, you don't understand salvation. Salvation is about what God did sending Jesus to cover all of your sinning. But it doesn't stop. Now, we're called to sin less. But repent does not mean stop sinning. And some of us have been taught that's what it means. Stop sinning. Okay, what you're going to see is I'm pretty sure that's not how God talks. I'm going to show it to you in Scripture, all right? Let me give you a couple of words in Scripture for the word repent. I'm going to give you three. If you're taking notes, write these down. Here's the first one, Nahum. This is a Hebrew word, Nahum. It means to grieve, a strong desire to change. And the birthplace of that strong desire is a grieving over the sin, Nahum. Let me give you a Greek word. It's the word metanoia, metanoia. Some of you have probably heard this. It means to turn around, to do a 180, to go in the opposite direction, but it also means a complete change of thinking. Third word for repent in scripture, shub. It's the Hebrew word shub. And here's what it means. And it's probably my favorite of the three words. It means a change of mind towards my sin a decision to, to forsake sin and obey God. Now, very quickly, uh, let me just give you a little bit of background on repentance. I understand that there are two types of repentance. There's the repent to live repentance that happens at salvation. Then there is the repentance as a part of a lifestyle of repentance. What I'm talking about today is the repentance that's a part of the lifestyle of repentance. Okay? Not just the at salvation turning from my sin and to God. I'm talking about an everyday, consistent lifestyle of repentance. Now, there are really two reasons for repentance. Okay? And your notes are on the screen. I put two categories. It's really better um, described as reasons. There are two reasons we repent. Here's the first one. Okay? I'm write this down if you're taking notes. Doing a bad thing. I repent from doing a bad thing. But the second reason for repentance is I repent for not doing a good thing. Now, you might be thinking, because you're that TMZ gossipy type person, what was the sin God spanked Preston over? I'll tell you, okay? And here's what really frustrates me. It's like the enemy has taken the word repent and attached it to pornography. So when somebody says, I need to repent or I needed to repent, they have a porn problem. That's ridiculous. And it bugs me to no end. Because there are hundreds upon hundreds of things on a daily basis that I have to repent of. Bad things, but also good things that went undone. Okay? Well, and it's not a shining moment of mine. Uh, but here's, here's the reason the big reason for the spanking I got. 
While I was sitting there with my friend, the Lord reminded me when I was a boy, the morning that he said to me, Preston, the only thing that will keep you from experiencing everything I created you to do on my behalf is not your enemy, but a lack of prayer. And here's what's kind of embarrassing to admit, that for the last couple of months, my prayer life has not been good. And here's what's scary. I'm not, you know my heart, I don't brag. There are hundreds of thousands of better preachers than me. But the last couple messages have been anointed. And that's actually kind of scary to me. That I could ever become a professional preacher who could walk in God's anointing, but privately be separated relationally for any amount of time. And you know, I don't know if you're this way, but when the Lord spanks me, anybody ever been lovingly spanked by God before? Can you just put your hand up so we know we're in a club? Okay, good. Good. If you didn't raise your hand, it's coming. Don't worry. <laughs> it's simply because you haven't embraced it. It's called rebellion. I'm just kidding. I'm really just kidding. Uh, but as he was saying this to me, here's one of the ways I know I'm wrong when I try and make excuses when he points it out. And here's what, here was my response to him. Yeah, but it's been a crazy couple of months. And then I tried to play this card. And I'm just being totally honest. <laughs> and I mean, come on, we're fostering a baby right now. He, he sleeps in my office, which is my quiet place to be alone with you. And it's like literally I felt the Holy Spirit say, that has nothing to do with me. And it just drilled it on me in love. And listen, let me, let me just say, because maybe you're here, or you're watching this online, and you don't know Jesus as friend yet, personally, because you're so afraid, you know all the bad stuff you've done, you're afraid that if you come to him, he's going to beat you and spank you for all that you've done. Here's what you need to know. You will know you have come face to face with Jesus when you understand he doesn't spank out of anger. He doesn't yell and scream. He is not an abusive spanker. He's a loving corrector. I told my wife that night, I've never felt so loved <laughs> than for those two hours where I felt like he was just correcting me. So let me give you three very simple steps to repentance. Okay, here's the first one. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. Now, implied in that, is that we look at that which we've done that is bad or that which has gone undone that was good that we should have done. Now remember, let me just remind you, if, if you want scripture on this, that we need to repent when good has not been done. That's James 4.17. You can write that down. Go, go read it and study it. James 4.17 says, To him who knows what is good and does not do it, to him it is what? That's right, it's sin, okay? So God forgive me. It's taking a look, it's addressing in honesty and transparency before the Lord my sin. God forgive me. Step number two, God change me. Not I change me, God change me. God wants to be involved in the turn. Because as we all know, there will always be some temptation to go back. And we need God's help to change our hearts, to help us not just change our habits, to change our hearts. I saw a friend who had struggled with alcohol addiction for almost three decades, give his life to Christ and pray, God, change me. And in a moment, I watched God do something he could never do. And for the last five years, he hasn't had a drop, a sip, or even a, a hankering for alcohol. Why? Because he was so powerful to change? No. Because he prayed, God, change me. And God did. Okay? Step one, God, forgive me. Step two, God, change me. Here's step three. God, watch me. Watch me. Matthew chapter three, verse eight. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins 
and turn to God. Some translations say, bear the fruit of repentance. Repentance has fruit, proved by the way you live. Now, th this is, for those of you who are competitive, this is the fun part of repentance. Because some of us, if there's bad we've done in our past, something we've struggled with for a really long time, here's what the enemy does. You're gonna struggle with this forever. Now remember, he's the father of all lies. So anytime he talks to you like that, you just need to remind yourself, ha, that's right. Everything you say bounces off of me, sticks onto you, because I'm rubber, you're glue. It's that kind of thing. You're lying to me. That's not true. But here's, if you're competitive, here's what you do. In repentance, we walk in the opposite direction with the opposite habits and rub it in the enemy's face who has spoken lies over you, lies over me saying, you're going to deal with this your whole life. No, I'm not. Well, you don't have the power to change. You're right. My God does. And together, we're going to change. And I'm going to turn and go in the opposite direction. Now, here's one of my problems with how repentance has been preached. Many of us have gone to a, a ball game and seen an angry preacher on a street corner with a bullhorn screaming, Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, do you think that's the tone Jesus used when he showed up? Uh, uh, let, let's just test this out. Jesus came to propose to humanity on behalf of the Father. Okay? Will you spend forever with me? Have you ever seen anybody propose to somebody by screaming at them? You will marry me! If I was a woman and you proposed like that to me, I'd look you in the eye and said, fool, please, please, get out of my face. Okay, listen. Evangelism is like engagement. We don't need to yell and scream at people. Because that's not how God talks. Listen, condemnation says, you're guilty. Get away from me. Conviction says, you've sinned. Come here to me. And this is what frustrates me about the way repentance has been taught. Here's a phrase that's often associated with it. Turn or burn. Can I just be real? This is the third service anyways. That's so stupid. That's so stupid. And I don't think that's how God talks. Turn or burn? How romantic is that? Marry me or you're going to be miserable. And I'll put scripture on it. Ezekiel chapter 18. If you're a turn and burn type, let me read this to you. Ezekiel 18, 30, God says, repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Put all your rebellion behind you and find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O people of Israel? I don't want you to die, says the sovereign Lord. Turn back and live. You see, Repentance is not turn or burn, it's turn and live. Now, the word picture, the reason shub, the Hebrew, Hebrew word shub is my favorite of the biblical words for repentance, is there's a word picture attached to the word shub, and it's this, to burn up so as to never revisit again. You see, repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. Let me just give you something extreme. God forbid, but let's say I cheat on my wife. And I go to her and I say, baby, I am so sorry for what I've done. And then two days later, I cheat on her again. What good is my request for forgiveness if I continue on in sin? hurting her. Repentance is not just, God, I'm sorry. It's, God, I'm done. I'm not doing that anymore. 
I'm done. And I'm going to turn towards you and this in every area of my life. See, it's not turn or burn. It's turn and burn. To burn up so as to never revisit again. Here's the second question, and we're going to breeze through these two questions. Second question, what happens when we repent? Flip over to Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Tell us what happens when we repent. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Here's the first thing that happens when we repent. God forgives us. God forgives us. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus yet personally, and you're so ashamed of the sin, and the way you see yourself is like that child who's been playing in the mud, came into the house, got all of the couches, the bed, the floors, all filthy muddy, and your mom is screaming at you saying, how could you do this? How could you be so filthy? And you think that's how Jesus is going to talk to you when you come with all that dirty stuff. And let me help you understand how Jesus will receive you when you finally come to him with all that mud. Come here. I'm not mad at you. I'm not afraid of your mud. I died to clean all that stuff up. Bring it to me. Baby, let me clean you up. Let me get that off you. When we repent, God forgives us. Here's the second thing. When we repent, our quality of life immediately gets better. Look what happens next. Repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Verse 20, then times of refreshment will come. Now, notice, I didn't say things will get easier. I said they'll get better, even if they get harder. Because when we repent, before we repent, it's like carrying a weight on our shoulders in our own strength. And when we repent, it is the equivalent of getting it off of our shoulders, giving it to God, letting him deal with it, never to put it on our shoulders again. There is a lightening of the load that immediately improves our quality of life. Repent so that your sins will be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from where? From the presence of the Lord. That's the third thing that happens. God comes even closer. What you will feel when you repent, when you turn from those ways, you will feel God get closer. Here's the good news. He was always that close, but it was your turn that got closer to him. And here's what, what I want you to remember about repentance. The goal of repentance is intimacy. It's intimacy with God. And when I don't repent, there is something I have allowed to get in between the two of us that is harming our relationship and most certainly harming me. And here's the third question. What happens when we don't repent? First thing, sin will be your downfall. It will be my downfall when I don't repent. Ezekiel 18.30, repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. When I don't repent of my sin, it is going to cause me to fall at some point. Second thing, oh, and let me tell you, David in Psalm 32, go read Psalm 32, he writes this about his season after the Bathsheba ordeal. He writes about what was going on with him when he was trying to hide what he had done. Listen to what he says in Psalm 32, 3. When I refused to confess my sin, in other words, when I hid it, hid it and held on to it, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. In other words, I was miserable. I knew it was wrong. I knew I was wrong. But when I was hiding it and holding on to it, I couldn't handle it. Here's the second thing that happens when we don't repent. You make God wait while you miss out. That's 2 Peter 3, verse 9. I know this is talking about 
repent to live repentance, but make no mistake, it can also, and I believe it absolutely does also apply to the repentance that is consistent every day of our lives. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, with me, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Here's what he said to me on Thursday morning. Preston, I've promised you some things, and they're going to happen. That is not up for debate, because my word doesn't return void. They're going to happen, but son, they cannot happen until these things first happen. See, when I was a kid, I used to think that the worst thing that could happen with God is that he would be mad at you. And here's what I'm learning after four decades of life on this earth that it's far worse when God's waiting on you. Not because he's mad, but because there are things he wants to do through you, in you, and even for you that will not and cannot be done until these other things are first done. When I don't repent, when you don't repent, we are holding God back from doing those things. And all we have to do is turn from them. And here's the third thing that happens when I don't repent. I keep God at a distance. I keep him at a distance. And here's what's awesome about the God of the universe. One of the greatest stories Jesus ever told was the story of the prodigal son. A son receives his inheritance from his father, leaves home with it, wastes it on horrible things, throws it all away, ends up in a pig pen, and has a come to Jesus moment in the slop of the pig pen. And he begins building out this incredible I'm so sorry speech that he would give to his father because he knew it was time to go back home. And one of my favorite things that Jesus puts in this story is that the father was not sitting on some kind of throne angry about the son's leaving. The father, the Bible says, saw the son coming from a long way off. And he ran to him and embraced him. And here's what you need to know as it relates to repentance. If you don't know Jesus, God is not waiting to whoop you because of everything you've done. He's been waiting to receive you and take care of everything that has been done. And if you do know God as Father, and you've been over here doing some things that you know you shouldn't be doing, maybe it's anger, maybe it's covetousness, maybe it's lying, maybe it's cheating, I don't know, but you know you, you've gone beyond dabbling and you're borderline drowning in it. And you've created some habits that you're not sure you could even stop. Here's what you need to remember, that your daddy is sitting out on the front porch waiting for you to turn, to come to him and say, I am done with that mess. And here will be his response. Come on, come away with me. Come on, let's get as far away from that garbage as we can, and let's just be together. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Whether you're here in this room right now, or maybe you're watching online, I believe this is a moment between you and God, nobody looking around. The scripture says that ears to hear and eyes to see, both are a gift from the Lord. And I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. Because I know there are some people in this room who are drowning and they want out. I know we have some of that, but I also know there are some who don't think they're drowning that actually are. 
And I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. Holy Spirit, would you give every one of us ears to hear and eyes to see? If there's anything in our lives that would keep us from stepping into this next season of our lives, being fully used by you, enjoying everything you want to do through and for us, if there's anything getting in the way right now, Holy Spirit, would you point it out to each of us? I'm going to ask you to do something. Every head bowed, every eye closed. With all of my heart, I believe this very well could be a turning point for our church. Something as simple as one word, repent. The whole world was turned upside down when the Son of God left heaven, came to earth, showed up on the scene and the first word to us from him with his feet on earthly soil were these. Repent. Turn. For the kingdom of God is at hand.